This is CBC Late Night News. Good evening, I'm Talia Ricci. The progressive conservatives are doubling down on a move that makes it harder to sue the provincial government. Attorney General Caroline Mulroney tweeted just hours ago in defense of the plan, details of which emerged in the budget bill tabled last Thursday. Lawyers have criticized the step, calling it regressive. And as Lisa Shing tells us, the opposition is now adding their voice to the list of critics. This legislation is buried in the budget bill. It would make a lot of what the government does immune to lawsuits, including class actions. First of all, a plaintiff will have to get permission from a court to sue. And it'll limit the cases in which the government could be on the hook for compensating the people who do sue them. The NDP says it's going to make a lot of noise about this one. No government should be above the law. No government should be able to escape the consequences of, of negligence. They shouldn't have immunity. They shouldn't be untouchable. They should be covered by the law. Now, every province in Canada sets limits on how and when people can sue them. But some lawyers say the Ford government is taking an extra big step to protect itself with this one. And there's no province in the entire country that's taken it this far. A human rights and refugee lawyer says there's almost no financial liability if someone is harmed by government policy or decisions made in good faith or when the government is exercising its authority. I think it should be concerning. What the government's saying is, in effect, that with great power should come no responsibility. Not only that, this law could be applied retroactively if passed, and there are several class action lawsuits that could be affected. Back centuries ago, there was this idea that the Crown should be immune from any lawsuit. What we're seeing is a regression back to this idea that the government should not be liable for its actions. Another lawyer tells us the only other similar situation he can think of is when the Zimbabwe federal government took similar measures to protect itself from being sued. So we reached out to the Ministry of the Attorney General in Ontario and it says it's simply updating outdated procedures and clarifying as well as simplifying the process. Lisa Shang, CBC News, Toronto. This goes beyond loyalty. The final chapter of smash hit Game of Thrones begins. Who will survive? We'll check in a little later in the show. But first, the provincial government is also set to square off against the feds in court tomorrow over the carbon tax. They're challenging the federal government's right to impose the tax. They're arguing regulating greenhouse gas emissions falls under the jurisdiction of the province, not the feds. The federal government gave all provinces the option to come up with a carbon pricing plan of their own by April 1st or face a federally imposed one. The four-day hearing will be before a five-judge panel and will be live streamed on cbcnews.ca. An emergency meeting of Toronto's Board of Health is happening tomorrow after the province announced in the budget it's slashing the number of health units from 35 to 10. The PCs are also reducing their funding by nearly 30 percent over the next two years. Board Chair Joe Cressy says the cuts are devastating. All this is going to end up doing is drive more people into the hospitals to drive up the cost of health care and to hurt people's health as well. Police have released a photo of the vehicle involved in a hit and run near College and Spadina early this morning that left a man in life-threatening condition. We're hoping that anyone that had witnessed this uh, failed to remain or this occurrence may have information that can help investigators locate the black SUV. It happened just before 2 a.m. The 21-year-old man was standing at a transit shelter when the SUV mounted the curb and hit him. The driver then fled. Police found a side view mirror on the scene and are now looking for a Ford Expedition or a Lincoln Navigator. The victim remains in hospital with life threatening injuries. Provincial police in Northumberland County are investigating after human remains were found north of Campbellford. OPP say the remains were discovered Saturday night in a wooded area of the park. It's unclear if there was any foul play involved. This was the scene of Fighting Island last night near Windsor. Crews spent several hours extinguishing this marsh fire. 
The island is used as a corporate retreat and education center for Windsor-Essex. It's hosted more than 30,000 students, but now it's not exactly clear when it will be safe to reopen to visitors. There were no injuries and no damage to buildings, but the extent of damage to the marshes is still unknown. Taxing uh, physically on the, the crews, it's, it's a difficult, uh, very hot and very difficult type of fire to fight. Uh. Officials are still investigating the cause of the fire, but at this time it is ruled accidental and not suspicious. An Ontario First Nation is in a state of emergency tonight. The residents on the shore of James Bay knew that rising waters would again force them to flee. But they didn't know that this year the danger would come so fast. Olivia Stefanowicz looks at their plight and the politics. From the air, the danger facing Kasechuan is clear. A menacing wall of ice breaking up as far as the eye can see, threatening the small Cree community each spring. It's really uh, frustrating for a lot of people. Chief Leo Friday says this year's heavy snowfall makes the possibility of flooding especially worrisome. Another concern? The reserve's dike is on the verge of breaking. An engineer's report calls the risk intolerable, forcing chief and council to declare a state of emergency yet again. More than 2,000 people are preparing to fly out this week. It will cost taxpayers roughly $20 million. I have no way of making sense of a nation as rich as Canada that would leave a community uh, like Kishetchewan in such a precarious situation year in, year out. Carl Bennett. In 2017, the community signed an agreement with the federal and provincial governments to find a permanent solution. But two years later, little progress. Our commitment to a long-term re relocation has not changed. That has not changed. What we're doing right now is we're working with the community on just the technical aspects of the move. Meanwhile, talks are ongoing. The permanent move will cost $500 million to $1 billion. Land has been identified 30 kilometers away, but it hasn't been secured yet. Until that happens, people like Brandon Gochi will continue to brace for the worst. I don't think it should be like that. Like, is, oh, I'm hoping one day that uh, it's going to be like a, just a regular uh, annual breakup up river just to stay home and relax, not worry about evacuating. Indigenous Services Canada says it could take another 8 to 10 years to make the big move. The people of Kasechewan will continue to fly south every year, not knowing whether they will have homes to return to. Olivia Stepanovich, CBC News, Ottawa. Sophia Kambalia joins us now for a first look at weather, and it's pretty wet out there. Some roads in Toronto even starting to flood. Hey, April showers in a big way. We're going to talk about the flood risk in detail a little bit later in the show, uh, but I'm sure many of you heard the rumbles of thunder, saw some of the lightning that rolled through the GTA and will continue to. I want to show you how close we got to all the severe weather stateside. This is the top edge of the cold front that spawned tornadoes from Ohio all the way down to Texas. Some of these storms uh, not as severe as they were stateside. Cross Lake Erie, and we saw them anywhere from Niagara, Oakville, Burlington, and the risk continues into the overnight hours, really just east of the GTA, but these storms are beginning to die. The rain is beginning to clear. Yeah, we picked up a ton. Uh, you mentioned some areas starting to flood, 15 to 30 millimeters of rain when it's not midsummer and the ground is still pretty frozen with reduced ability to absorb is quite a bit. As we look forward to Monday morning, the rain clears, maybe a passing shower or two, but it's misty, it's drizzly, it's kind of cool, just a few degrees below freezing. Some areas north and west of the city, higher elevation like Kitchener, for example, could see a few flurries even Monday morning. But then we warm really nicely for the drive home Monday afternoon and Monday evening. Some areas in the GTA even pushing the double digit mark. Now, when we return, we'll talk more about the flooding. We'll also talk about the warm up and the long range. Some areas, folks, in this upcoming work week could see 20 degree warmth. Wow, we'll Just check maybe. in a little later, Sophia. <laughs> The pressure is building in Toronto as the city hopes for a turnaround for both the Leafs and the Raptors. Descended to overtime. Kawhi doesn't go. The team with a bad history in Game 1's failing to pull any new tricks against the Orlando Magic. Game 2 is scheduled for next Tuesday right here at Scotiabank Arena. 
Fans hoping three-point Kyle Lowry will show up this time. He was held at zero points for the entire game one. He does a lot more than, than just score, and, and uh, he'll make shots. He'll make shots. He's, he's done it. He's proven it. And uh, we got game one out the way, so, you know, we'll, I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, how he turns out on Tuesday. Thank you. And with a 1-1 tie, the Leafs also looking to play a better game tomorrow at 7. They may have to play without Nazem Kadri after he checked Bruins forward Jake DeBrusque in Game 2. But we'll find out for sure tomorrow. And in the women's hockey world, in the women's world hockey championships, Canada took home the bronze. Now, settling for bronze might not sound too bad, but this comes at a sensitive time. The Canadian Women's Hockey League recently collapsed. And as Natalie Nanowski explains, many top players that Canada faced off against were trained there. Everybody always focuses on Canada US, Canada US, and they always just assume it's going to be Canada US in a final, but this time it wasn't the case. While professional hockey player Carly Campbell concedes that missing the world championship final is a hard pill to swallow, being knocked out by Finland could actually inspire young girls around the world. Women's hockey is about hope and now they finally have hope that they can compete at the highest level in international hockey and it's like that for other countries as well so they're going to start investing in their young girls because good things are happening. Campbell played for the Toronto Furies in the CWHL which before it collapsed was considered prime training ground. Country sent their top players to learn from Canada's women and hone their skills including Finland's goalie Nora Ratu who showed off her talent today, blocking shot after shot against the U.S. It was inspiring watching the Finns play hockey, and, you know, you had to, had to cheer for them. It, uh, it did so much in their home country. I think that the other countries are really believing they can be there. Women's hockey does have support in other countries. Sweden has an elite league founded in 2008. It has 10 teams. Even tiny Luxembourg just launched a women's hockey team. And China has been building dozens of new rinks just to keep up with the sports demand. It's estimated that 200,000 women now play hockey around the world. And that number is growing. Despite the disappointment over Canada not winning silver or gold and the collapse of the CWHL, there's proof that women's hockey around the world has a bright future. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. Spending a few extra dollars on this vegetable? I went behind the counters to figure out why and for how long. Details after the break. Oh, what design? They were quick on their feet in the face of danger and in doing so ensured the safety of many. Today, five security workers at Yorkdale Shopping Centre were honoured for their actions during last summer's mall shooting. Kelda Yoon reports. A special day for Nigel Penny. Shane Palmer, Luca Aiello and Jordel Rosley, whose mother Colette accepted the award on his behalf. The four security guards recognized for their bravery. Last August, as panicked shoppers fled from gunfire inside Yorkdale, the unarmed guards ran towards it. Nigel Penny remembers it like yesterday. Because we don't know where the shooter is, if there's more than one shooter, myself and a few of my other colleagues actually brought some of the customers, tenants and people within that area into our office so they can seek shelter and safety. It turns out an altercation between two groups of men had led to one man firing a gun. Some shoppers managed to rush out. Others remained inside as a lockdown was put in place. In the end, no one was injured. It was a, a high-stressed, uh, high-tense situation. Uh, my adrenaline was obviously pumping because of the nature of the incident. But uh, I just kept consistent with the help of my teammates. I had my head in the game. I was very proud of the, the work that they did and, and the fact that they stepped up to the plate in a, in a tremendous time if need. And it wasn't just the guards. Security officer Marco Rotondo was also honored for his actions, including quickly reviewing surveillance video. Once the stress level kind of calmed down, then I was able to work a little bit more efficient, um, got the proper information I needed and passed it along to emergency services. Rotondo's descriptions helped police arrest the suspect quickly. 
It's definitely highlights uh, the hard work and all the training that we go through. It's very humbling to receive an award and be recognized for something I do on a constant day, which is ensuring the safety of the tenants, customers, and everyone within a shopping center. The five are among 38 people to receive community member awards at Sunday's presentation. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. A recent health food trend sparked by celebrity personalities has started a celery juice craze. It's driving local shops to purchase more and more bunches of the stocky green. But keeping up with the demand is getting increasingly harder as the price of the vegetable soars. It's showing up on social media feeds just as fast as it's flying off the shelves. But getting in on one of the latest health fads isn't cheap. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the celery juice craze that you've been experiencing here? Absolutely. So beginning this past fall, we started receiving requests for pure organic cold-pressed celery juice. We wanted to try it ourselves. We wanted to understand what the nutritional profile of straight cold-pressed celery would look like, whether there were any potential red flags before deciding to release the product. Um, but in fact, it's been the most requested product in Greenhouse's history. Knight says they aren't a business that jumps on bandwagons and miracles aren't listed as an ingredient in this drink. But we do believe in more vegetables more often, and this is one great way to drink vegetables. You get a concentrated dose of the potassium, the folate, the magnesium, the vitamins K and C, so you are really getting a good antioxidant mineral profile from the juice. But if you're thinking it's just this juice craze that's responsible for driving up the price of this vegetable, I'm here to tell you that's not necessarily so. And that's primarily because in Toronto, our celery comes predominantly from California or from Florida. And in California, they've had a lot of low rainfall seasons, so that means low production of celery, which, you know, is a high water content food. It's a recipe for high prices because growers can't keep up with the demand. Broom says the cost of spinach and lettuce has gone up too. But celery was hit the hardest, with the biggest hike happening these last two weeks. So for the, the wholesale price of celery, where it comes in a carton of 24 heads, it's jumped from $34 up to $110 for a carton. Once local production kicks in this summer, you should be able to stock up on these greens at a more reasonable price once again. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. A shopping experience at the Enercare Centre this weekend almost guarantees no buyer's remorse. More and more businesses are uh, starting uh, to realize that having a social mission embedded in, their, in the core of their business is an important thing for them. Uh, there is demand from consumers to source uh, and to use and wear things that are socially and ethically sourced. The Buy Good, Feel Good Expo focuses on social enterprises, which are businesses that give back. The expo had more than 150 vendors who all share a common goal, to make ethical consumption the norm. April is Limb Awareness Month, and a Toronto fashion designer is making the cold much more comfortable for children with limb conditions by making custom mittens with the perfect fit. An event was held this morning for this special project. A few years ago, I was contacted by a grandmother in the U.S. and she was um, looking for mittens for her granddaughter who didn't have fingers on her left hand. It sort of alerted me to the need for adaptive clothing for children who are missing fingers. We're trying to increase awareness, uh, have the conversation, but also we're trying to increase visibility. It's just so important for us. I think that um, showing diversity and including everybody in um, like promotions and advertisements is huge. Well, it's just really difficult for her little hand to fit in um, like a conventional mitt. And so you worry that her, the fingers that she does have are not going to be warm. Other than the safety part, it's just, I think, important for her to feel like everyone else. Just so that she doesn't feel like she's different and that she is basically viewed the same as everyone else. She's not treated as less than or looked at less than. She's just perfect exactly the way she is. Well, it's still a wet mess out there, but will the rain stick around for the morning commute? We ask Sophia after the break. Stay with us.
The wall is crumbling in the north. Plots are brewing in the capital. The final race to the Iron Throne has begun. The last season of Game of Thrones premiered tonight. No, we won't give you any spoilers, but we asked some fans to take a stab at who will win the Iron Throne. Lisi is my favorite, so hopefully she wins it all at the end. Arya Stark. I think it's going to be Arya Stark. I hope that John and Daenerys become the next leaders. With this kind of show, like it, I think they are always blindsiding you with the surprise. I'm expecting to be surprised, but I cannot say a name. Fans can't take their eyes off the screen. This is the show's last season, which will run for six episodes. Farmers in the Utaway region are sounding the alarm over some two-legged troublemakers. Wild turkeys have made a nuisance of themselves. They were reintroduced to the area, but farmers now say they're wreaking havoc on their crops. Sophia Kambali is back with another look at the forecast. It looks like we'll see some relief tomorrow. Yeah, uh, some nice clearing, especially as we head into the afternoon. We are seeing that rain come down. Heavy, though, throughout the Coburg stretch, uh, heavier pockets, but it is a clearing story into the overnight. And if you want to talk about a real clearing, we got to look till the end of the work week. Here's what you want to wait for, the 20-degree warmth that hopefully I'm promising you. A uh, long-range warm-up, yeah, the upper teens and even pushing the 20s for some of you, Barrie, Niagara, even into the GTA maybe, but it could come with the active weather and a wet price tag. By midweek, a new Colorado low is forming. It'll be our story Wednesday into Thursday along the warm front. And then we get into the warm sector, this dry slot here with this really nice southerly flow. So Thursday is going to be the day to watch on the seven day forecast in just a minute. And then Friday, it stays mild and nice and warm, but we will have the wet weather along the cold front. Here is your seven day forecast. Yes, the rain clears into Monday. We'll talk about how it's still kind of cool and drizzly for Monday morning. But then double digit potential really for much of the work week. Thursday looks to be the really good day here. Uh, wet and active, but still warm for Friday. We're locked into this blocking pattern. It's what's causing all the severe weather stateside as well to continue to bubble up with the Gulf moisture. But we will be on the receiving end of the warmth, especially if you're away from a lot of the lakes. Look at that. 22 on Thursday for those of you in Niagara region. Time to head down to the falls that day. Maybe work from home, work remotely. Uh, same story for those of you in Barrie with the potential of 20 degree warmth on Thursday as well. Okay, we'll talk real quick about the floods, uh, flood outlook rather. Many regions have raised that flood concern over the next few days. Avoid caution near any waterways. And it's still a little cool and wintry feeling for Monday morning, but you warm up by the afternoon. I like your positive outlook on that. The rain makes the sunny days all worth it. Thanks, Sophia. April showers, May flowers. <laughs> Thank you. That's our show for you tonight. And for those of you heading out there in Toronto, heads up several roads submerged tonight. Some of that likely to cause some troubles on your morning commute. Good night. Thanks for watching.